many believe the fight is a fixed fight? How many know this battle? Have you ever met someone that spoiled the movie for you? That told you the end before you even saw it? Well, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. Jesus resurrects from the dead. The battle that you're facing today is already defeat. It's already been won. And whatever fight you're facing right now, just know this, you got the victory. I don't mean to spoil it for you, but you already won the fight. It's already done. It's a fixed fight. How many believe that tonight? If you believe that, give Jesus one more shot of praise. God is so good. I'm going to read a quick scripture for you as you stay standing. 1 Corinthians 1, 26. It says, remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy and freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. Lord, and I ask, Father, that you would speak right through me. I humble myself before you, God, and I know I cannot do this without you. Father, none of us here are interested in any man-made opinion, God. We want the word and we want the truth of the word of God. So tonight we open our hearts to your voice and we ask you, Lord, speak to us. We're ready to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say amen and amen. You may be seated. Say hi to someone. Give someone a high five. Let them know I like your shoes. Me and the organ player actually matching shoes right now. Hey. So there are some really, really cool underdog stories in the world. And I think we, could, we all like a, a good underdog movie every once in a while. Rocky and, and whatever other underdog movies there are out there in the world. But there's some amazing real life stories of underdogs that rise up to become great, like the 199th pick of the NFL draft in the year 2000. He was a nobody, a backup QB who would only get his shot because the guy in front of him was off to a slow start. This guy's name is Tom Brady. We all know his name today, and whether you rep his team or not, we have to respect that he will probably go down to what is the great, one of the greatest of all time but no one would have ever predicted back when he got started that this no-name player would become the greatest of all time. And then there's uh, some nobody boxer that would face the greatest pound-for-pound -pound fighter. The odds were totally against him. It was 42 to 1. To put that in mathematical terms, that means he had a 98% chance of losing that fight. Not to mention that 20 day, 23 days before his fight, his beloved mother would die of a stroke. His name is Buster Douglas. He defeated Mike Tyson. And to this day, this fight goes down as, as the greatest upset in sports history. These people probably never saw themselves achieving such great feats, but they all started somewhere. And this gets me thinking about even where I started and even about where I am today. And I hope that this message and about uh, what we're going to hear tonight gives you hope and encourages you to understand one thing about God. It's this. It's that he takes things that appear weak, helpless, and not enough, and he makes those things great. Today, I believe we're going to hear from God, and we're going to unpackage what God says about humble beginnings. The title of the message tonight, if you're taking notes, is 
it's only the beginning. Someone look at someone next to you and say, it's only the beginning. Zechariah 4.10 It's a great scripture for anyone who feels a little discouraged about where you're at right now. The word says, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. The word is saying, don't be upset. Don't hate where you're at right now. Don't get mad that you're not past where you are. Just rejoice that God has started something within you. And the word says that he is faithful to complete the work that he started in you. And if you give him a little room to work, believe me, trust me, he will do a miracle in your life and he will use you for great things. Tonight, we're going to hear three examples of humble beginnings in scripture and what they teach us. The first thing we're going to learn is an example of someone that was not enough or something that was not enough. It's the story of the boy with five loaves and two fish. Five loaves and two fish isn't even enough for me when I'm hungry, let alone 5,000 people. John 6, 5 through 11, let's turn there. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? And he was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. He said, there's a young boy over here with five barley loaves and two fish. He's, he brought his Lunchable with him. Uh, I, I think, I, I don't know, I, I'm not... I'm not too sure, but my interpretation of scripture here is that he was being a little sarcastic because he goes on to say, yeah, there's five loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd? Saying we have this little lunchable snack over here, but what good is that going to do? And I could see some of the other disciples smacking him in the back of the head saying, man, don't say dumb stuff like that anymore. But Jesus goes on to say this, tell everyone to sit down. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone outnumbered about 5,000, which means there was easily more than 5,000 people there. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish and they all ate as much as they wanted what does this story teach us? Well, the first thing we can learn from this is that there, the, the, the disciples had something that they saw as not enough. Not enough to meet the need. Not enough to feed the people. It was not enough to get the job done. And I think a lot of us, when we do an inventory on who we are in our own lives, we can fall into that same trap. And maybe even get a little sarcastic with God and say, God, I'm just a nobody. I don't really got enough. I don't have all the experience and the accolades and the resume to do anything for the kingdom of God. Who am I? I've been coming to church for a month or I've only been back for three weeks or I, I don't even do anything here. I, I'm not enough. I have enough. I don't have enough. I'm sorry. I don't have enough. But what does this story teach us? It shows me that what you have may not seem like much, but it is enough. See, anytime you involve Jesus in what you're doing, he will multiply what little you have. Jesus is not one to shy away at doing a miracle. Jesus was a walking miracle. And Jesus lives within us today. And if Jesus is among us here and now, believe me, he will continue to do miracle after miracle. And one of the greatest miracles we see today are people that have come from very, very humble beginnings that claim that they do not have enough to do what God wants them to do. They, they do not have enough knowledge of the word or, or they do not have enough skills or they do not have enough courage. But I'm here to let you know that what little you have is enough for God. 
Now, if you took your little five loaves and two fish and just presented that and put that in the hands of Jesus, I promise you, it's enough for him. See, it may not be enough for you and it may not be enough for the world because the world standards say something completely different. But to God, it is enough. And as a matter of fact, I believe we serve a God that specializes in doing the impossible things. And some of those things include fooling the world to to know that God gets the glory, that he can use someone as little as me and you to do the impossible. The world looks at you and thinks, how? How in the world can someone like you preach the gospel? How can someone like you make disciples? How can someone like you even step foot in a church after all that you have, after all the little that you know, all the little you've done? How can you claim to be a Christian? Well, here's how. Because you didn't pay your own debts. Jesus paid your debt. You didn't make the way. Jesus made the way. You weren't perfect. Jesus was perfect just for you. So next time someone bashes you for living for Jesus, just let them know, hey, it's not even me, bro. It's all Jesus. He's the one that lives in me and through me. I know I don't look like much. I know I can't say much. I know I can't even do much. But the little I have and the little that I am is more than enough when I put my life in the hands of Jesus. You don't have to be so concerned about not having because because you serve a God that does have. The Bible says that the birds don't even worry about what to eat. I've never seen a worried bird. Have you you ever seen a worried bird just comes out of the nest like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. Actually, that's kind of how they move. Maybe they do look a little worried. I've never seen, I've never seen a bird knocking on a door. I've never seen a bird uh, oh, just waiting in line for some food. I, 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 I mean, birds just, just kind of trust they're going to eat. Some birds are really bold. They know that you're going to toss some food out of the, of the table and give them some food. They just know they're going to eat. The Bible says the birds don't even worry. So then why should you? If God takes care of the birds, wouldn't he as a loving father take care of every single one of your needs? I know it seems like humble beginnings right now, but trust me, God will provide for you. He will provide for you. Another thing I learned about this story is this simple formula. Jesus plus the little we have equals an abundance. Write that one down. That's a formula you're going to memorize. Jesus plus the little we have equals an abundance. There's a great story in scripture of a woman, it was a poor widow, which means she didn't have a husband to supply any of her needs. And at that time, if you were widowed, you were a beggar, you, would had, you had to have been taken care of. There was not much you could do for yourself. But this poor widow that couldn't do much for herself, when the time came to give, she gave two mites. Two mites is the equivalent of less than one penny. And with inflation today, I don't know what, what it is. It's probably... Way less than that. And, but she gave, the Bible, Jesus noticed this, and he says that she gave out of what little she had. And it's interesting to think that Jesus, his attention was caught on her offering. Now, right next to her were very, very wealthy Pharisees and, and these other zealous religious leaders, and were giving loads and loads of money, and it was... Not all that impressive to the heart of Jesus because this woman gave to Jesus what little she had. And remember, the formula isn't to be the greatest and to to have the most. The formula is Jesus plus the little we have equals an abundance. Now, when we come to the feet of Jesus, it may seem like we don't got much to offer him, but I'm telling you, it's enough for him. And I'm not saying he wants your checkbook. I'm not saying he wants your money. I'm saying he wants your heart. And some of you feel like your heart is so damaged and depleted and stepped on that it's not much to give God. But I'm I'm letting you know tonight that Jesus absolutely desires your heart and he desires a relationship with you. And you may feel like your life has been totally ruined by the past and by this world, but it's enough for Jesus. Trust me, Jesus plus the little we have equals an abundance. In the scripture, we can see earlier, it says that Philip 
spoke up and he said, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. That was verse seven. Even if we worked for months, it's crazy to think that not even months and months of labor and effort and work could amount to what you have now when it's placed in Jesus' hands. Like I could labor and I could fight and I could do all, I could put all my effort into trying to achieve the greatness that God has for me, but, but push God to the side. I could, I could labor and I could do years of effort and I could work on my skills. I could work on the craft. I could work, I could work very, very hard and keep Jesus off to the side in a corner. And even those years and years of labor and decades and decades of striving and giving my blood, sweat and tears into something could not amount to giving even what little I have into the hands of Jesus right now. You are better off giving what you have to Jesus now than to work years and years and years and decades aimlessly chasing what you cannot achieve without Jesus. Give what you have now. Put your life into the hands of Jesus. I know that this may seem like a, 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 a maybe a tough place for you, but remember this, it's only the beginning this could be your underdog story where you could look back and say, I only had so much to offer God. I felt like it wasn't enough, but he turned all of that around and he turned my life upside down and he made me into the man or the woman that I am today. And I thank God that he believed in me, that he saw something in me and I'm going to put my faith in my life and my trust in him. And I know that it's only because of him who I am today. How many believe that tonight? Before I preach, I, I always say this prayer before I pray. I'm home studying and, and I'll spend hours just studying and, and, and reading through scripture and even sometimes just sitting there staring at a wall, just trying to hear from the Lord. But there's one thing that's consistent when I, before I preach, there's a prayer I always pray and I say, God, I need you. I always say this, I can't do this without you. Without you, I have nothing to say. Anything I say means nothing. I can't do this without you. I say this prayer because I know it's true. As much study and as much effort and the hours I put in to prepare a message and to be up here and to, to, to dig in scripture and to, and to hear from the Lord of what he has to say, I know this, that no matter how much effort or work I put into this, it means nothing if I don't have God. And, and I remind myself this, that I can't do this without you, God. I can't preach without you. I can't even live for you without you. I can't resist sin without you. I can't, I can't even go throughout my day without feeling like I need to cut somebody out without you, God. I just, uh, without you, I can't do it. I cannot do this without you, Lord. And I think that's a prayer we sometimes need to get back into our heart because we can get so gifted that we think maybe I can do this without God. Maybe, maybe my gift got to the point where I don't really need to pray as much or I don't need to be as humble as I used to be. I remember back in the day, I used to spend all my days and minutes and hours praying, but maybe I don't need to pray all that much anymore because I think I got the hang of it now, God. We're good. I'll, I'll catch you later. I'll let you know how it goes, God. And I wonder if we approach even our life like that and we say, God, I'm good. I got it. I pray that we never get to that point. I pray that we, we can always look back and remember where God brought us from. And we can trust and believe that it was only God that got us there. It's only God that's going to sustain us where we're at. And it's only God that's going to keep us going or where he's calling us to be. It's only God. I can't do this without you, God. Let's say that together. So I can't do this without you, God. The second example of a humble beginning in scripture, we learn that about not enough from the boy with five loaves and two fish. The second is this, this phrase, this idea, too weak, too weak. And I learned this from the story of Gideon, who was the weakest person in his camp. Look at Judges 6, verses 11 through 16. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Those are some wild names. 
Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Gideon was hiding. He was scared. He was afraid. His town kept getting raided by the enemy. So he was hiding, totally out of position of where he would, where he would normally do that. Then the, uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. So interesting that a scared little boy hiding away in a wine press is called mighty hero. It's interesting to think because if you ask Gideon about what he thinks about himself, he would say something completely different. Verse 13, sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us, told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. I think we've been there before. I think we felt at times in our life that we were so weak at a lowest moment, we almost felt like God had abandoned us, that God left us. Where are you, God? Where are you right now? I have nobody, I have nothing. No one is in my corner. People don't believe in me. I've let people down. I've let myself down. God, where are you? When I need you the most, where are you? I think we felt that at times. So weak that we think God abandoned us. It goes on to say, and the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have. Go with the strength that you have. Go with whatever strength you can muster up. Go with whatever it is you have. You think it may not be enough. You you think you're too weak to even move, but even in that weakness, you think it's weakness, even in the little strength that you have, go with that. Move with that. Take a step with that. I've heard this saying, if you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. If you can't crawl, I don't know, roll or something. Just move. (laughs) Go with the strength you have. And I don't know what kind of strength you got right now. I don't know where, where you fall in that spectrum or that category. If you feel like you're a runner or a roller, I don't know where you're at. But the Bible's saying, just go with the strength that you have. You may think you're too weak, but you're not weak enough for my power. The Lord is saying, even though you feel weak, my power works greatest in your weakness. I can do more than you can. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are greater than your ways. You have no idea, but this is all a setup to reveal my glory, that my power works greatest in your weakness. Go with the strength that you have. It says, and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. And and I'm the least in my entire family. Not only do I come from the worst gang, but we get stomped on. My family gets punked. We got a weak family. And that family punks me. I'm the punk in the punk family. It doesn't get worse than me. He's saying, I am so weak. And the Lord said to him, I will be with you. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you're fighting against one man. He says, I will be with you. God is saying, I don't think you took this thing to consideration. I know you're weak. I know you're the punk of the punk family. I know I get that. But I don't think you consider this. That I'm sovereign, that I'm the almighty God, that that I'm the ruler, that I'm supreme, that I created the heavens and the earth. I don't think you understand this, but when I'm in your corner, when I'm backing you up, when I'm with you, when I'm fighting for you, nobody can come against you. There's no weapon that can be formed against you. None of it can prosper. When I got your back, 
There is no demon in hell. There is no bondage. There is no chain that can't be broken. There is no sin that can't be destroyed. Not even death itself can take over you. When I got your back, there is nothing you can't do and no one you can't conquer. Take this into account. I am with you, the Lord says. Don't forget who is fighting with you. God makes it a point that he'll be with us when we're focused on the mission. Even the weakest person in the whole room can appear the strongest when they're paired up with God. You may say things like, I never saw myself doing this. I never saw myself being that kind of person. I never saw myself achieving this or achieving that or being used in this way for the gospel. You may say all these things, but I know that God uses those who even the world thinks are weak to do great things in Jesus' name. How many believe that? And you know, forgetting, I think it was important for him, and I think it's even important for us for, to not forget where we came from. Look at Titus 3, 3 through 7. It says, once we too were foolish and disobedient, we were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy and we hated each other. But, someone say, but when God, our savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously, which means he held nothing back. He generously poured out the spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Recognize that without God, we are left to our natural state. We're foolish, we're disobedient, and we're evil. We're weak against sin and temptation. We can't fight by ourselves. But with God, you can do impossible things. You can trust in the process that he has you now. It may be a humble beginning you're at right now. You may feel so weak, but it's only the beginning. Someone tell someone next to you, it's only the beginning. Someone asked me recently. We were, um, we're actually on a road trip, my wife and I, and, and, uh, and, and another. We're, we're going to go see Natalia graduate. She just graduated, by the way, my sister-in-law. From GCU, shout out. <clears throat> so we're on a road trip to Arizona, longest drive in the history of the world. And, um, and we were just talking, and, and one of the questions that someone asked in the car was, if you could travel back in time and give yourself any piece of advice, what would it be? Now, that's a loaded question. And that's a loaded question for a pastor, too. You're like, you're like man, I got to get deep right now. What scripture to come to mind? But, but what came to mind, this is what I said. I would tell myself that we grow in inches, not in miles. What do I mean by that? We'd like to think that we grow from a seed straight to a fruitful tree. We'd like to think we grow from a baby to a full-fledged warrior in the battlefield. I think we like to think that we go from zero to 60 in, in no time flat. But we grow in inches, not in miles. And the reason I say that is this, is because a lot of times we think that we can just fast forward or skip steps, but what God is saying is just remain consistent with what I have you right now. Just take another step. Don't worry about the next mile because I got all that covered. Trust me, it's all part of the plan. Just take the next step. Now, if you're worried about where to go from here, or about how you're going to get to the other side, here's what you got to do. Take the next step. Now, if you don't know how you're going to get to your 10-year your vision, your 10-year goal, and how are you even going to make that happen? Because you know we're close to that. This is what you got to do. Just take the next step step. We don't grow in miles. We don't grow in these crazy, ridiculous things that we see on social media. We grow in inches. And a lot of times you don't even realize how much you're growing just by being consistent and coming to church, being discipled, serving in a ministry. Oh man, I'm serving this ministry every single week. Yeah. And you're growing too. 
<clears throat> man, these floors are always dirty, man. They always make these floors dirty. And they, these toilets are always dirty. I always got to sweep these floors of the church. I got to do all this stuff. Well, you're growing every single time you're sweeping. <clears throat> Oh, man, I got to go to another service. I'm tired. I'm tired. I just want to sleep in. Well, I'll just go anyways. Well, good, because you're growing. You come on Wednesday. You go to your discipleship group. You serve in a ministry. Everywhere you go, every inch is another inch. It's growth. Be consistent in your growth. We don't grow in miles. We grow in inches. How many know that to be true? It's only the beginning. Point number three. I'll review really quick. What are the three examples? Number one, we learn not enough. We learn too weak. And number three, the end of your rope. We learn this from the woman that was hanging on the last of her oil. Look at 2 Kings 4, starting from verse 1 through 7. One day, the widow of a member of a group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, My husband who served you is dead. Here we go, another widow. And you know how he feared the Lord, but now a creditor has come threatening to take my two sons as slaves, threatening to take everything I have. What can I do to help you, Elisha asks. Tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all except a flask of oil. This flask of oil was the last she had. There's not much more you can do. The flask of oil, I'm sure, is what she used to cook, to provide for her sons and to eat. She was hanging on that. Potentially her last meal. She was at the end of her rope. It was a very, very end. There was no other option. There was no more hope. She was at the end. All options were exhausted. Nothing else. Nowhere else to go. He said, okay, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it is filled. Now, if I got that instruction, I'd be like, um, hang on. So I'm not sure. You probably misunderstood. I have, a empty, I have a flask. Okay, there's only about this much left. So if I pour it into the big jar... It, It'll be all gone. You understand? So he goes, so she, but she listens. She did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her, and it says she filled one after the other. And she's holding on to what looks like the very, very end is all she had. It's the end of her rope. I can just imagine what's going through her mind is, this is the very end of all I have. This is what I had to feed my last meal of my family. This is, this, there's nothing else I have but this. And as she pours and she pours and she pours, it fills the jar. And the flask is still full. And she says, son, bring the other jar. So she's thinking, this is the end. I'm at the end of my rope. I have n not much more to give. I, 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 I have nothing else until the jar is full again. Onto another jar and another jar and another jar. And the Bible says she did as she was told. And soon every container was full to the brim. And she says, bring me another jar. So I'm bringing another one. Come on, bring it. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Move, move, move. Son says, there aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil, pay all your debts, and you and your sons can live off what is left over. What does this story teach us? This tells me it's never too late for God. Even when you're at your last option, it's not too late for God. God can intervene. Do you feel like you're at the end of your options? Do you feel like you've tried everything else? Do you feel like nothing else is working? Maybe the, the raise you got at work didn't cut it for you. Maybe the pain you've been experiencing, you've been trying to numb it, but it can't be numbed. It never goes away. 
Maybe, maybe you're at the very, very end of your options. You don't know where else to go. I got good news. You ended up at the right place because God specializes in moments like this. It looks like it's the end. It looks like there's no hope. But, but I'm here to tell you something. It looked like there was no hope for Jesus. All his disciples left him. He was hanging on a cross and he said, it is finished. The devil thought that he won, but he didn't. It looked like it was the end, but Jesus resurrected from the dead and because he resurrected even though it looks like there's no hope for you there is hope for you it's not too late for you remain available for God and he'll keep pouring remain open to him and he'll keep moving through you remain a willing vessel to the Lord and he'll keep pouring in his anointing in your life just remain under him and he will keep using you in ways you never thought you could be used. Just stay available to God. Someone say, I'm available, God. <clears throat> and never say this. Never say, I'm taking a break from God and ministry. Don't ever say those words. Those words, every time I've heard those words being spoken, it was like a spiritual suicide. People have left the church, left their faith altogether. When people say, I just need a break from God in ministry. This is just a forewarning. I know, it's, I know it feels like it's, it, it maybe feels like it, it, it's building your endurance. Maybe it feels like it's taking everything within you just to keep going and enduring. But remember this, we grow in little inches. We don't grow in miles. Just give it another inch. Just keep going. The Bible says, don't grow weary and do good and well-doing. Don't get tired of doing good. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Because at the right time, you'll reap a harvest of blessing if you do not give up. I don't know if I'm speaking to anybody today who's getting a little tired. I'm going to encourage you, don't give up. Keep going. You will reap the harvest. It's right around the corner. Don't stop. It's for you. It's a promise not from me. It's from the word of God. Trust and believe that his promises always return to him. I want to share something with you. This was my humble beginning. I was a kid. I was 12 years old when I preached my very first sermon. And... I, it was bad. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So I found a, uh, as a cassette, actually, I found the cassette tape or my mom found it in like a box in her attic or something. And so I pull the cassette tape out <clears throat> and I throw it in a cassette player. Yeah, I have a cassette player, believe it or not. Uh, did I date myself? I think I did. Um, I found a cassette player. I found some headphones. This is what it is right here. <clears throat> and it's called, hang on, before right. we play it, before we play it. It's called Having Faith in God by Brother Christian De La Rosa. It's from the church we used to go to, Lighthouse Fellowship. Shout out to Pastor Mike. Um, and actually, the person that recorded this for me, I was 12 years old, is Fernando Cappuccino. I don't know if he's here tonight, but you may know Fernando. <clears throat> He recorded this for me, and I just want to give you a little taste of it. And, and I'm not showing this to you to brag or boast because I'm telling you right now, it's not good. I'm here to let you know that we all have humble beginnings, and we all got to start somewhere. This was my start. I was 12 years old. This was my very first sermon. Um, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead and play it. All right. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Mark chapter 11. Verse 23, and it says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So, um, KJV. What he's saying is that if you believe in your heart that you can do something and you have no doubt and you believe in God, then you can do all things. Even like moving a mountain. And then even like move a mountain. Um uh
All right, let's continue reading. Therefore, I say unto you that... Yeah, so that was basically the whole sermon. I would read a verse and say exactly what the verse said and just go, uh, next verse. That was my first sermon. I was 12 years old. I didn't come out of the womb knowing how to preach the word of God. I was so scared. I actually invited friends from school that day and they were sitting like near the back. All of my friends were laughing the entire time. So later in the sermon, I'm laughing because they're laughing. It, it, was, it was an embarrassing day for me, but I don't despise that day because it was a humble beginning for me. And when I listened to that tape, I remembered how, how much faith it took just to stand up there for four minutes. It was four minutes. I could have played the whole tape and we're done. <laughs> it was four minutes long. And I remember jetting out of there and just wanting to hide my face. And I was so afraid. I was so nervous. But I did it. And I just said yes. And I used the faith of a mustard seed. And I think it's so ironic that the first message I preached was on the faith of a mustard seed. And I want to encourage you today. I know that it may seem like you're in a very low place today. I know it may seem like you don't know where else to go. Like you're not enough. Like you're too weak. Like you're too young. Like you're too little. Like you're too inexperienced. But all you need it's just a faith of a mustard seed. All you need is just, uh, just the little that you have. And the little that you have, when you put that in the hands of Jesus, it's more than enough. What you have in the hands of Jesus is more than enough. How many believe that tonight? How many received a word tonight? Let's all stand to our feet as we close. This is only the beginning. This is only the beginning. It's not the end. It's not, it's not the place where, where you've gone too far. It's only the beginning. If I could ask, if, if you're thinking about leaving, just, just hang out for a second. Just hang out for a quick second. Don't leave yet. A few more minutes. It's only the beginning tonight. Tonight could be the beginning of your eternal life. It could be the beginning of your relationship with God. Tonight can be the beginning of you stepping foot into your purpose and in your call. Again, you feel like you have nothing to offer. You got very little to offer. Believe me, it's more than enough in the hands of Jesus. What he's done for you is more than enough. He paid the ultimate price. The Bible says the price of the wages of our own sin is death, which means that the price we owe is much more than we could ever pay. But Jesus knew that he could pay it. Not only could he pay your debt, but he could pay everyone around you with his own blood. And so he willingly did it. He gave his own life. He willingly gave himself to be crucified on a cross and to die. But then three days later, he resurrected from the dead. And when he did that, what he actually did was take back what sin and death had over you. And he stole the power from it. So no longer will you have to pay the penalty of your sin because Jesus paid it all. So now Jesus says, if you put your faith in me, if you repent, turn away from your old ways, just turn to me. Trust me. Give me the little that you have. You'll be saved. I'm here to let you know, God loves you. He has a plan for your life and he can use you. Give your life to him tonight. Don't depend on your own good works. Depend on Jesus. I want to make two calls. If you tonight are saying, whatever was spoken tonight spoke to me. I've been feeling like I was not enough, too weak, or the end of my rope. And I feel like I need, I needed this word. I needed that boost of encouragement. I needed the word tonight to fill me. And I know I need to respond to that because I know that God has something for me. And I just need to walk up there and come into agreement with somebody and pray. I'm gonna count to three. If you're saying, I just need to respond to that. And this word was for me. And, and, and I just need to come into agreement with somebody. 
that I'm gonna give God my everything. Even if I feel like it's little, I'm gonna give him everything tonight. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. One, two, three, just raise your hand if that's you. Come on, keep your hand up. I see you, I see you. Anybody else, I see your hands right there. I see your hand. Awesome, I see your hands over there. I see those two hands right there. I don't know if I missed it. I see your hand, I got you. I see your hand too, I see you. For those that just raised your hand, I want you to do something kind of bold. I want you to make your way out of your seat and come up here as a sign of faith, as a step of faith saying, you know what, I'm gonna give God my everything. I'm giving God even what little I think I have, I'm gonna give him everything. And as they come up church, why don't we give them a roaring applause of encouragement because we're so, so excited for them. Crown me with confidence, I am seated yes. in the heavenly place with the one who has conquered all. Another call I'll make is, is if you need to give your life to Jesus tonight, again, like I said, the wages of sin is death, but Jesus paid the price. But if we don't allow Jesus to pay the price, what we're saying is I'll take the tab. I will cover it. But the only way we pray, we pay for our own sin is by eternity in hell. Hell was not a place designed for you. It wasn't made for you. But that's where we go when we decide to reject Jesus. If tonight you're saying, I, want, I don't want to reject Jesus. I want to welcome him into my life. I want him to be my Lord and my Savior. If tonight you want to give your life to Jesus once and for all, then when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I see you. I see you over there. Anybody else? I see you waving. Anybody else? You're giving your life to Jesus. If you raise your hand and you're not already up here, I want you to make your way forward because tonight is a great night. Let's clap it up for all those that just raised their hand. If you raise your hand, come on up. We want to congratulate you and pray with you tonight. It's who I am. It's who I am. Come on up. Come on up. It's who I am. You're good. Yes, he's good. It's who you are. Oh, it's who you are. you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. Now for all those that are coming up and just a few more are coming, I want to let you know that you're making a great decision tonight. Jesus is enough for you, bro. He loves you. I love you. God loves you so much. And what you have is more than enough for him. Let him use you. Trust him with your life. He's your everything. He's all you need. He's all you've ever needed. And tonight I believe something's changing in you. And God's going to use you for great things. Do you believe that? I believe that. How many believe that for our brother right here? We believe it. For all those up here, God has a plan for you. He has a, he has a way for you. He has a purpose for your life. The person that's in front of you that's going to pray with you in just a second, they can actually help you take a step towards that. They can help you take that step. And if you don't know what to do from here after coming up here, you don't have to worry. We have a whole system in place to help you grow. It's called discipleship. It just means being a student of Jesus. We're going to help you be a great student of Jesus. Tonight's the night for that. And believe me, it's going to be the best decision you've ever made. Your life will change forever. And you'll never regret this. Let's bow our head. Let's close our eyes. And I want you to repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I give you my heart. I believe that you sent your son to die on the cross for my sins and to resurrect so I can be saved. My faith is in you, Jesus. Thank you for choosing me even when I felt like I wasn't enough. I was enough for you. Fill me now with your spirit generously pour your spirit upon me make me a new creation from this day forward i'll never be the same my life is yours in jesus name i pray amen and amen
Why don't we give Jesus some praise tonight for what he said, what he's done. Now tonight was a great night. If you need prayer, stay up here. If you need prayer, come on up. We'd love to pray with you. But Sunday, someone say Sunday, is Marriage Challenge Part 2. It's kicking off again. If you haven't got your packet, pick up your packet. If you haven't invited someone, you still have some time to let them know. Let's make Sunday the biggest Sunday we've had all year. Let's invite people, friends and family, singles, engaged, dating, married. Let's let somebody know about this Sunday. We love you guys. Have a wonderful night. Remember, if God is for you, there's no one who can come against you. God bless you. Have a great night.